You're listening to Life, the Universe, and Everything Else. Today on the show, we talk about parapsychology. Life, the Universe, and Everything Else is a program promoting secular humanism and scientific skepticism produced by the Winnipeg Skeptics. You can email your questions, comments, or criticisms to us at l-u-e-e-podcast at winnipegskeptics.com. Show notes, references, and relevant links can be found at l-u-e-e-podcast.wordpress.com or at winnipegskeptics.com slash blog. My name is Jen Newman, and joining me today we have Lauren Bailey. Hello. Ashlyn Noble. Hi there. And Laura Creek Newman. Hello. So before we get into our topic for today, we actually got some feedback that I'd like to share from our last episode. Yay! We got this email from our friend Leslie, who was a guest panelist on our recent episode about intelligence in animals. And I'm just going to quote it because there's lots of good information in there. Just finished listening to the Mental Health and Stigma episode. Great job and kudos to Lauren for sharing her story. I just wanted to mention, as it was touched on in the podcast, that there are some options for those who struggle with mental health but don't live in an urban center. Some clinics and hospitals will do Skype-type sessions that can be done from a person's home or library, and, and of course hospitals. So if getting to a city once a week is out of the question, it may still be possible to have talk therapy with a qualified professional. The unavailability of doctors is a huge problem. Remember that doctors aren't your only option. If you don't think your doctor understood what your problem is, try the public health nurse. If you're a veteran, you can try Veterans Affairs. If you're a First Nation, maybe your band has other options. Or try a Friendship Center or Aboriginal Mental Health Program. If you're a student, your school might have a counselor. Or if you're lucky, your work might give you access to options that you may not know about. It is really easy to get discouraged and give up after one or two or three unsatisfying and sometimes insulting experiences. It takes a lot of strength, but keep trying. Miss you all, Les. Well, thanks, Leslie. Pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. So our topic today is parapsychology, literally alongside or beyond psychology. Parapsychology is the scientific investigation of psychic phenomena and other paranormal experiences that could conceivably be classified as psychological in nature. Parapsychology includes the study of things like telepathy, telekinesis, precognition, and mediumship. While parapsychological investigations are often, but not always, and not historically, funded by private donations and institutions rather than uh, public funds, the field is routinely criticized for continuing to pour money and time into investigating phenomena while being unable to demonstrate convincing evidence that these phenomena even exist, a distinction it shares with several other branches of pseudo-scholarship, such as <laughs> cryptozoology. So much better. There are monsters. You know, he's got that going for it. Parapsychological investigations are often either ignored or openly derided by members of the larger psychological community, and it is exceedingly rare to see a parapsychological paper published in a mainstream psychological journal. But, as we'll see later, it does happen. Parapsychologists use the term psi, the first letter of the Greek psyche, meaning mind or soul, to refer to the unknown factor responsible for experiences that cannot be accounted for by known physical or biological mechanisms. And by the way, I'm totally going to edit in the theme from psi factor here. God, I love Matt Frewer. <laughs> Sometimes additional Greek letters are used to distinguish between extrasensory perception, psi gamma, and psychokinesis, psi kappa. For fans of Earthbound or Super Smash Brothers, that's uh, where names like PK Fire or PK Thunder come from. Psi kappa fire or psychokinetic fire in this case. I love Earthbound. Another uh, little bit of terminology, you'll often hear the terms telekinesis and psychokinesis used interchangeably. This is reasonable, as telekinesis literally means movement from a distance, while psychokinesis means movement with one's mind or whatever. Uh, psychokinesis seems to be the more popular term these days, but there is apparently an actual distinction between the two of them. Psychokinesis, according to the literature, refers to the mental influence of physical systems and objects without the use of any physical energy while telekinesis refers to movement of physical objects by purely mental force without any physical intervention. This distinction to me, however, seems like total nonsense <laughs> and completely meaningless. So continue to use them interchangeably, who cares? 
Today, we're going to limit ourselves to a couple smaller spheres of parapsychological investigation. We will be discussing several of the most noteworthy parapsychological research projects in the last few decades, uh, some of which our listeners might be familiar with. Ashlyn is going to be covering the Gansfeld experiments, which date from the 1970s. Laura will be telling us about the Global Consciousness Project, which, as far as I can tell, is an attempt to determine if random number generators can detect a great disturbance in the force. <laughs> Uh, Lauren will relate to Rupert Sheldrake's research into morphic resonance, I think, and I will be talking about Daryl Bem's controversial Feeling the Future experiments. Finally, we're going to end the show with a surprise game of psychic <laughs> fact or psychic fiction, but oh, not before Laura tells us about JT, the psychic dog. Sound like fun? Woo! There's going to be puppies, so I'm in. All right, Ashlyn, why don't you start us off with uh, the Gansfeld experiments? All right. So, the Gansfeld experiments... Gansfeld is German for entire field, is a technique used in parapsychology, uh, which is supposed to be able to test people for ESP or extrasensory perception. They involve taping ping pong balls over your eyes. So you <laughs> cut a ping pong ball in half and then you tape one half over each eye. And you're supposed to have, be in a room with sort of an ambient red light. Uh, I don't know why red, there, that wasn't really explained in any of the bits that I read. The pictures of these, though, are super creepy to look yeah, at. Yeah. Like, it looks like something from a 70s, like, schlock horror movie. <laughs> yeah, because everything is just bathed in red light whenever you look up pictures of this. Um, and then you put on headphones that have either white or pink noise, so static. And you're supposed to stay like that for 30 minutes. And so while you're in this Gansfeld uh, field, which is supposed to sort of uh, strip away all thought and... Is it supposed to be like sensory deprivation exactly, chamber? Exactly, yeah. That yeah. kind of idea? Okay. It's sort of a low-grade sensory deprivation because there is the static and so on. Um, someone else during the experiment is uh, sometimes watching a video is usually um, what I've heard described or looking at an object and that person is thinking really hard about sending that information to the person who is being uh, put in this sensory deprivation state. So after the half an hour, they wake you up <laughs> and uh, take away the ping pong balls and they have you describe what you think the person was trying to send to you. Or sometimes you will be trying to describe what you're seeing as the experiment is going on. So during the half an hour, they'll have you talk about what you saw. So what kind of techniques do they use to determine what's a hit and what's a miss? Like, what are you describing? Is it really detailed? Because it seems like there's a lot of room for interpretation there. I don't know. <laughs> Do you know the answer to that? No, no. Okay. I was... <laughs> Some of the earlier experiments, uh, one of the problems was that they would use short video clips. And because the video clips that were used as the target video clips would be used over and over again, and they would uh, deteriorate more than the control video clips. Um, and so when it was asked, like, which of these has the clip that you were looking for, they would be able to tell which one was most used, so that would get picked more. Oh, so the, so the person who was sending would watch the video, yeah. and then they would play back that video and the control video and the person who is receiving is supposed to pick which one is the real one. Yeah. And because the experiment video that was being watched was, has been played twice as much, <laughs> it is all like kind of shitty and warbled. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I was thinking that the people were saying, okay, well, this is the video I watched and it was getting around from the different Yeah, that's what I was. Oh, yeah, okay. that's what I was thinking that, you know, was cheating yeah, on the test. Just, yeah, exactly, cuz they would just talk about it and it's like, "Oh, everybody here." So then you sign up and you end up in the like in the experiment <laughs> group and you're like, "Oh, okay. Well, it must be this." Yeah, that's that's not what I heard was the problem, but there are a lot of problems with this experiment as we will discuss. <laughs> so, this got really popular because they were able to manipulate the data to make it look like people had ESP, basically. Um, there were so many issues with the controls and the blinding that it was really easy to take the data and be like, yeah, the uh, the obvious explanation for this is that people have ESP, not that our control <laughs> is terrible, uh, but that... You know, the person in this field, in this Gansfeld field, is actually receiving intel from the other room. Uh, one of the biggest problems was that in a lot of the experiments, especially some of the more foundational ones, uh, the person sending the information was like 14 feet away from the person who was supposed to be receiving, and there was no soundproofing. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> so they could just hear the video sometimes. <laughs> um, eventually they put up these like soundproofing contact tiles, but they didn't do anything like block the door jams or anything like that. So it really didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Often the experimenters weren't blinded as to which of the videos were being played. So that would have been a huge source of error. You'd think that it would be really great to just repeat the experiment with a control, which is nobody acting as a sender and then just play the video and see how that worked. Yeah. Yeah, that would be interesting. It, it may have been done, actually, because this experiment has uh, become really popular. And it it's one of those things, as you were saying, that they will just keep throwing money at and keep doing this experiment yeah. over and over and over again. And as you would expect, the more times they do this experiment and the better their control becomes, the less of an effect we're seeing. Richard Wiseman did a good article uh, sort of refuting this these guys Storm and Ertel. These guys, Storm and Ertel, did a big comprehensive study and they took all of the studies that had been done before and ran the data and they came up with, uh, yeah, there is totally a positive effect going on here. People definitely have ESP. That's a meta-analysis. Yeah, a meta-analysis. I'm sorry, I couldn't remember the word. And so Wiseman and uh, his colleague Julie Milton went over the data again and went, well, yeah, but you included all of this data from the 60s where we know for sure that the experiment was not done well. Right. Right. People have sort of taken the Gansfeld experiment and used these, this Gansfeld field to do other things, which I think is really cool. There's a lot of articles on the internet uh, about hacking your brain the legal way, which is all about basically putting yourself into a state of sensory deprivation and then recording what you sense. <laughs> and so I found a page where people had uh, submitted some of the things that they had hallucinated under the state. And I just wanted to read a couple of them because they're pretty funny. <laughs> An urban scenery like an empty avenue after a rain, large areas covered with water, and the city skyline reflected in the water surface like a mirror. That sounds calming. That sounds lovely. <laughs> <laughs> it was like running a bobsleigh on an uneven runway right down. There was snow or maybe water running down. I could hear music. There was music coming from the left side below. So I can kind of see how like static and sensor deprivation could lead you to feeling like you were zooming down a bobsled course. Sure. It's kind of interesting. Here's a creepy one. In the right side of the visual field, a mannequin suddenly appeared. He was all in black, had a long, narrow head, fairly broad shoulders, very long arms, and a relatively small trunk. He approached me, stretching out his hands, very long, very big, like a bowl. And he stayed so for a while, and then he went back to where he came from, slowly. Slender man? <laughs> <laughs> I was just picturing, like, Guy Smiley. <laughs> so... Being in one of these states of sensory deprivation can lead your mind all sorts of places. And when you're given, you know, however many, you know, four probably videos to choose from, I'm sure one of the things has something to do with something you were thinking of during that thing. Um, they, in a, in meta analysis that take into account one's experiments that had good controls, there is no effect. Mm -hmm. So that's the final say on that one. <laughs> cool. Actually, Daryl Bem, who uh, we'll talk about a little later, believes that the Gansfeld experiments are pretty definitive in favor of Psy. <laughs> but he has some other weird ideas, too. Well, I will fight him. <laughs> Before we talk about Bem, though, uh, let's move on to the Global Consciousness Project. Laura? Okay, so the Global Consciousness Project is a larger scale idea of something that's been going on since the 60s or 70s out of a lab that's based out of Princeton, though their that lab's relationship with Princeton University was tenuous at best. <laughs> anyway, it's based on the idea that many people's minds can become interconnected, particularly when they're engaging in similar consciously intense events or, or thought processes. So the, the hypothesis behind this global consciousness project is getting people to engage in these same kind of thoughts together can actually have physical effects on the physical environment around them. So it's a sort of telekinesis in a way. Less so in the sense that you would think of from movies and TV where you see somebody kind of hold out their hand or like kind of look at something and it flies around the room or something, but more so in just <laughs> in a very um, minor kind of way, telekinesis. Unimpressive. Unimpressive. Yeah, we'll go with that. But it's, yeah, I guess it is still kind of a telekinesis. So in order to 
test this phenomena or observe it. They do experiments using groups of people and mechanical random number generators. They're also called hardware random number generators. So these are devices that use very low level variations in known unpredictable physical processes, things like uh, thermal or static noise to produce random patterns of numbers. In these experiments, a test is considered positive for effect if the numbers are less random than expected for a given period of time. So often, or sometimes they'll refer to it as spikes in a certain number. Since often, <laughs> usually it's a combination of zeros and ones. It's binary. So if they right. see a spike in ones or a spike in zeros, well, they, you know, that's out of the norm. This is the least impressive experiment ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be it, fair, randomness is clumpy. But to be fair to the researchers, you can do statistical analysis on random numbers to see if their yeah. distribution varies. Yeah, you absolutely can. But you know, we're already starting with a premise that's really teeny tiny. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it, it gets better. So Global Consciousness Project is a global network of these random number generators placed all around the world. Data is collected and analyzed from these. And they're looking to see if there was an effect around what they would consider significant events so some example of these kinds of significant events are things like the death of a celebrity, sports tournaments, so like the Olympics or the World Cup, uh, the Academy Awards, <laughs> mass meditations is another one. In some cases, at least on the smaller scale, they've considered things like Princeton graduation a significant event. Well, they um, have to get their funding. So yeah, so the people who set up this large project and some of their smaller scale things, they've written small papers on the effect of you know wishing for good weather and they noticed how on Princeton graduations there's always good weather and they think that it's because there's all these people <laughs> oh who God. are there that want it to be such a nice day for a graduation so they wow. and they look at weather patterns and Princeton has nice weather whereas nearby communities don't so but must be the fact that all of these graduation attendees were really wishing <laughs> for good weather that day parapsychology is totally science guys Totally science. That is very much a Scientology postulate going on there. <laughs> Postulating the good weather and that the, all the red lights will turn green for me. Oh boy. So those are some examples of those events. And I think we can uh, agree that some of these types of events would probably be mass events or significant kinds of things. Um, some of them maybe less so. I don't yeah. know. I didn't go to Princeton. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I heard uh, the September 11th attacks was one of the ones that they were looking at. For yeah, states. I mean, like they often, they look at a lot of things and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But of course, there's a there's a bunch of issues with this project there. <laughs> oh boy. Um, one of the main developers of the project has said that at this point, they don't necessarily have enough uh, evidence to say that there is actually a positive effect or that there is any effect at all but let's the keep collecting the, yes oh. but let's keep collecting this data because <laughs> one day one day we'll find it the gambler's um, fallacy something like that must yeah. be so that's one big issue but poor reproducibility of results is a major issue one of the big flaws is that the time points of the data collection around these events is not consistent. Mm. So they will consider uh, anomalous variations in these number patterns before, during, an hour later, sometimes a day later, they will consider these positive. So in the case of the September 11th attacks, the spike actually happened before the September 11th attacks happened. So they're sort of implying that there was some kind of premonition. There was this global consciousness premonition. Daryl Bem would approve. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and that has all sorts of other implications and problems with that. So that's one, right? But they didn't notice a spike afterwards. So we would think that if all of these people are thinking about so intensely about the September 11th attacks, sure, we were thinking about a beforehand maybe but you'd think that you would see an even bigger spike yeah, afterwards if, if right there was a worldwide effect of a mental holy shit you'd, you think you'd feel it exactly yeah. I mean, it was on every channel everybody was talking about it exactly it and the only topic compared to some of the other examples i mean and that's a, a huge example too because that really penetrated a lot of the world or the western world yeah. perhaps right whereas something like the academy awards 
that's U.S. and Canada, and that's about and all it. And old white people. Yeah, and it's still not even a huge percentage of those people. So to put those on the same scale... But who's, who's studying Psy? <laughs> right. Old white, white people. people. So, exactly. So the, the timing that's considered positive and the fact that it moves around really makes this lose its credibility oh, or yeah. puts a lot of problems into it. If you can pick and choose which time you're going to choose the data, like that's just completely then, ridiculous. I mean, yeah. So if you can choose it up to a day later, why not two days later? Why yeah. not two weeks later? You know, it's close and ish, right? It's like saying, well, everything happens within two weeks of a full moon, right? Because it <laughs> does. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> But, you know, it's that same sort of thing, right? So when other researchers, independent researchers, have looked at these patterns that were said to be significant, when they've been compared to larger periods of time or other anomalous episodes, they've generally found that it's not outside of what you would expect of the normal spikes and fluctuations of a random pattern. Of course, selection bias is huge here, as we already kind of talked about. Not only can you pick and choose the times, but you can pick and choose the events too. So there's demonstrated events where, yeah, there seemed to be a spike. So one big example that the researchers have used was Princess Diana's funeral. There was a huge spike right at that time because everybody was in grief and it was so unexpected and it was just, she touched so many people's lives and it was worldwide, yada, yada. So if we all remember, Mother Teresa died like a week later, yeah. right? Also a very well-known person, perhaps more well-respected in some circles than others, but globally known, not all the same. Zero spike. Nothing happened around the time of her funeral. The authors chalk this up to, oh, well, just the intensity of the feeling at Princess Diana's was so great that that's why there was a spike. Whereas with Mother Teresa, she'd lived a good long life and people were sad, but not in the same way. So they can quantify how intensely people that they've never met were thinking, apparently. Did they skew all this data through when Elton John would release new songs? That might have been it. It might be an Elton John phenomenon. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm the Elton John effect. <laughs> I'm wondering how much confirmation bias goes into this too, because so far we've heard about all sorts of hits, but I want to know not only what our sensitivity is, but what our specificity is. Well, absolutely. So do we ha do we have lots of these spikes where there was no discernible world event? That we don't know. And my guess would be it would be chalked up to, oh, that's how randomness works. Except when we want it to work differently. Um, that's well, just my personal guess, though. Or I'm wondering if for every spike, they're able to find something that they're like, well, that was kind but, of significant over there. Maybe something happened over there. So that's what it was. Maybe. But we have lots of events that didn't have any spike associated with yeah. them. And it's not just this, like, Mother Teresa's funeral, but really significant events, like in the late 90s, there was an earthquake in Turkey that killed 4,000 people. This is a huge event. Mm. Nothing happened on their sensors at that point. Um, there's a couple other examples that I can't remember yeah. offhand. But these are very significant things that were on the news for a long time. People were thinking of it. It affected thousands and thousands of people. Nothing there. But we're going to make a big deal about some people watching a televised funeral. The other thing, too, is that they seem to be assuming that people engaging in the same activity is the same as everybody focusing on that same thing. Sure, there's millions of people watching the Oscars, but are they all rooting for the same person? Are they all even paying attention? Mm -hmm. You know, are they looking at something else on their phone while they're watching the Oscars, right? How do we know? So... So then what is the effect there? What are we really looking at? Is it the fact that people are sitting in front of a TV that's tuned to the same thing? Well, then we should have many spikes every time whatever popular sort of show is on. Order SVU is on. Yeah. Or the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> right. But, like, we should see that on a more frequent, predictable basis when, like, the top three rated shows come on TV or, yeah. or whatever it happens. But we don't see that. Yeah, right? like, what are the ratings of the Oscars as compared to, like, Breaking Bad? Well, they've been, run, the know, Oscars like... have been dropping for years. <laughs> That's a really low one, apparently. Yeah. Oscars ratings on ABC down to eight-year low. <laughs> yeah. 34.4 so, million viewers. Sure, it's a big thing, but I would, I would argue that it's not really that culturally significant anymore compared to other things. It's not globally significant. You know, there are examples of what constitutes significant events is very, like, North American and Europe-centric, 
And considering that a lot more people live elsewhere, there's probably a lot more stuff happening over there that they should be testing for that they're not or looking for that they're not. So there's all sorts of problems with this. But even if it works, even if there is an effect, the biggest thing that millions of people thinking the same thing at once can do is make a little random number generator, choose a few more ones than not. <laughs> that is it. That is all. We're not moving mountains here, people. Like, we're just like, why are... Okay, that is it. That is the effect we're looking for. So that is the Global Consciousness Project. Woo! That is super ridiculous that people have spent this much time on it. Yes. And money. And money. And yeah. money. Let's not forget the money. But we all understand why Princeton does not like to be associated <laughs> with this type of project any longer. So, Lauren, why don't you tell us all about the magical man known as Rupert Sheldrake? Oh, I wish I could. There is far too much to put into a single segment. Rupert Sheldrake was the discoverer of morphic resonance. That's sort of what it sort of ties into both what Laura is talking about and what Ashlyn was talking about as well. It's the passing of information to other beings. Kind of like what we're doing right now. (laughs) <laughs> yes, only in a psychic sense, just passing it along. So it's various perceived phenomena, particularly biological ones. They become more probable the more often they occur, that biological growth and behavior thus becomes guided into patterns laid down by previous similar events. So it's like a psychic mind rut that you kind of wear in the Pretty much. collective... Okay, well, that sounds like nonsense. Yep. <laughs> All right, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much all there is to it he also has the idea of the sense of being stared at psychic staring and i did a couple of experiments with psychic staring today or to yeah. ashlyn yeah. and to oh. dave and to the cats <laughs> and what were what were the results of these scientific investigations absolutely nothing <laughs> did the cats just stare back at you the cats didn't even notice nobody <laughs> noticed that i was staring at them this wasn't just like in a i'm going to stare at you now there was a few different times during the day today when I stared at Ashlyn and she was on her phone and she didn't she didn't look up. And occasionally she does that to me too, and but not for experimental purposes. Just because like <laughs> she I think she's willing me to go get her a Coke or something. <laughs> Which is more morphic resonance. It usually yeah. works. No, because you go, sweetie <laughs> and I know what you want. Mm-hmm. Oh, maybe that's what it is. I've been You're psych- convinced. <laughs> I'm convinced that every time she says, Lauren I can go up and get her a Coca Cola. <laughs> she's just. I think that's just more conditioned. Yeah. That's yeah. all. <laughs> Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> no, nobody knew that I was staring at them. Whether we were sitting beside each other on the couch, or whether I was on the treadmill, whether I was in the other room, just staring through the wall at them. So, so basically, Sheldrake's idea is that I guess everybody knows, and I'm putting air quotes there, that when you stare at somebody, they can like feel it and sense that they're being watched and. Sheldrake is saying that that's because we're all psychic? Yeah. And it's this feeling, you get this idea that you're being watched and you're being, like, something feels off and you look up and somebody's staring at you. It, the idea is not new to Sheldrake. Yeah. There were experiments done in, I think, 1908, and it was, I think, 50% thought they were being stared at when they weren't being stared at or when they were. So it came out to, like, a null it's funny because I hear people describe that feeling of being watched and I usually like I'll read about it in books so I'm familiar with it in that sense but I've literally never felt that way really yeah that's Hmm. interesting yeah there's a man named David J. Brown who conducted some of the experiments for Sheldrake he states that one of the subjects who reported as having the highest hit rates because there were some that were just like off the charts the they could always tell when somebody was staring at them but one of them was completely high on MDMA through all of the experience. Okay. It makes you okay. more open to the feeling okay. of No, being it makes you more paranoid. Well, that's yeah. what I was going to say. I was going to say, like, the people who are feeling this are usually feeling paranoia of some kind or uh, variation. So, so once again, he, 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 we come to the question of not type 2 errors, false negatives, but type 1 errors, false positives. Was this guy just constantly going, stop staring, stop staring, somebody's staring at me. I, I, I said somebody's staring at me, somebody's staring at me. Because if you're constantly saying somebody's staring at you, you're going to be right every time somebody's staring at you. But you're also going to be wrong a lot, too. Well, especially if you're just yelling, somebody's staring at me. You're not going to be wrong. Everybody is going to be staring at you. Everybody's staring at you. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, and Rupert Sheldrake has got 
he's got a couple of degrees. He's got, he had some good scientific thoughts. And then he kind of went off the rails with this morphic resonance and the staring. And this is how he's dedicated his life since 1981. And the dog thing, which I yes. think Laura's going to talk about uh, in a little bit. I was going to use that as a segue. So his theory is basically everybody's a little bit psychic. And you can train yourself to be even more psychic oh. and pick up on the stuff that's, that's the morphic resonance. You know, you oh, okay. keep, keep thinking at this and it'll keep getting easier, keep getting better for you. It is kind of almost surprising how many of these parapsychological investigations just take random people as their subjects, not mm. people who are like really psychic, whatever that means. But I think that's because, A, they have problems with the fact that you can't identify who's actually psychic because you haven't actually demonstrated that there's any effect. <laughs> uh, and B, it's really easy to recruit college students. So if you assume that everybody's psychic, then... <laughs> that's what I was thinking. It was the... What, what I was reading about these experiments, it reminded me of Peter Venkman doing the, the psychic experiments at the beginning of <laughs> Ghostbusters. <laughs> oh, that's such a good scene. It's only the pretty girls are psychic. Well, there was a segment actually on the Wikipedia page for the Gansfeld experiment um, where they talked about how you could increase the chance that your results would be positive if you collected people from certain groups, like people who already believed in psychic powers. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Yeah. Who would have so, thought? But there, there was even a little disclaimer, like, but, you know, that would skew the results or something, so we had to select normal groups to, so basically, you know, white male college students. <laughs> Laura, you'll right. be happy to know that Deepak Chopra, big follower of Sheldrake. Yeah, I've heard that. That's, yes. That's great. That's his jam. <laughs> From what I had read for him, too, it was, he has this idea that molecules in that have memory. Yeah. Sort of like like that like water thing. memory yeah. and, and stuff. And given his background in biology and the fact that we're learning a lot about genes and they can like be turned on and off mm. and things can be passed along in the genome and stuff like that. I can see where you could start with that idea or like at the cusp of that and go totally off in the wrong that's direction. Not, that's not and memory think, though. That's no. just there like DNA is a single molecule. It's a freaking huge molecule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it doesn't have a memory, it just is a, in a different shape. Like it's physically arranged differently. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I know. So that's why I'm saying yeah. like and I mean when he came up with these ideas, we knew way less about all this then than we do now, mm -hmm. right? So I can Trying to be charitable, I can kind of see how if you start off in that area, you could... Yeah, he kind of just went off the deep end. But yeah, he totally just... I, I fell down a, a wiki hole just reading about all his books. Oh, and like, oh yeah. yeah. Well, and then he probably quickly figured out that you can make a lot more money selling books to at sci fairs and stuff like yeah. that than you can through like research grants. So he's just like, to hell with it, let's do this. <laughs> Once you get the Deepak Chopra seal of approval, too, your well, sales are going to skyrocket. Yeah. yeah. So along with this everybody's a little bit psychic thing, Rupert Sheldrake also thinks dogs are psychic. I love this part. Uh, just a bit, though, or very specifically psychic. And in particular, this one dog who is presumably not alive anymore because these experiments were done in the 90s. Um, but it was a dog who lived in England in the 90s named JT. And his owner's parents actually were the first ones who were convinced that this dog was psychic and then they invited the investigation into this dog's abilities and then eventually the owner became convinced as well through these investigations. So both Rupert Sheldrake and uh, Richard Wiseman, Julie Milton, and M Matthew Smith's teams uh, conducted their investigations into this dog's abilities and basically what the dog was purported to do is that the dog was psychic and that it knew exactly when its owner was going to come home <laughs> i think we've all met somebody who has said their dog knows how to yeah. do this right yeah. so apparently this is some kind of amazing psychic power so it needed to be tested there were these two different groups that did the studies uh richard wiseman's team found that no, the dog doesn't appear to have any kind of special abilities. They don't seem to see an, an effect. Rupert Sheldrake vehemently uh, disagreed with that and performed a long series of experiments to uh, prove the dog's psychic abilities. So what he did is he would record, video record JT's behavior all day 
um, while the owner was gone. And what they would do is they would look at the number of times or the amount of time that the dog spent going up to this one window near the front door during JT's day. And so they did find that most of the time the dog was not near the door, but in the last 10 to 20 minutes before the owner came home, the dog would spend more and more time near the door. They, so they tested a normal routine, so basically the owner's normal day, but they also did do a much smaller sample of random routines where either the owner would come home earlier than normal or later than normal out of a normal day, or they would do completely random uh, routines where the owner would leave at differing times and would be paged to go home at some unspecified time that the owner didn't know about, though the owner did know that that paging would happen in a 45 to 90 minute window of okay. that day. <laughs> so the owner, so you know, that window would be like, well, between 2 and 2.45, I'm going to page you. So somewhere in there. And that would be moved around. And so Sheldrake found that even with that, yes, JT was still psychic. Um, <laughs> Good for I JT. Just love the way you say, yeah, JT was still psychic. <laughs> good boy. What a good yeah. dog. So there's a few issues with this. Now, this is one dog, right? And the sample sizes, though they did to almost 45 different experiments in total, it's still a fairly small number, especially to run really complex analyses on time spent and, and behavior and things like that. So they can't make conclusive or through good science, we can't make conclusive uh, recommendations about something. However, there are some potential problems with this. So, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. Some of the big ones that were pointed out by Wiseman's team include the sensory leakage hypothesis. This is basically the idea that JT was picking up on signals from the owner or the owner's parents or from these surroundings that would signal that either the owner was leaving or that the owner would come back at a certain time, something like that. It's so, essentially like a clever Hans effect, right? Yeah, or even just that same um, effect that went into Pavlov's dogs learning the routine, right? You'd mm -hmm. pick up that, oh, okay, the footsteps, the keys clanking, this means that food is coming, so you get that learned behavior going with it, right? So that's that sensory leakage. So even if they're not, if the owner's not saying, okay, JT, I'm going out, it's just the way that she goes about mm -hmm. her day. Maybe the, the parents act differently when she's not in the house, things like that. Even on those unpredicted times that were like different, where she would leave at 2 in the afternoon instead of 8 in the morning, um, she might act a little bit differently or maybe give him an extra pat or an extra bone or something like that. To There's all sorts of little things that we can do and we don't even remember or realize that we did them, right? Yeah. So there's that. There's also the anxiety hypothesis, which is basically that the longer the owner is gone the more anxious JT is for her to return. So the more JT goes to the door to wait for her, right? Mm -hmm. So when she's only gone short periods, even if she comes back at an unspecified time, the dog doesn't go to the door quite as soon because the dog's not worried about it. But if she's gone a longer period or something, the dog's going to go back. So again, they, they did say that with this dog's patterns, they couldn't confirm either of these hypotheses either. But we also can't discount them. And that was the problem that Sheldrake Ooh. really wanted to discount both of these issues. The problem with that, though, is that if Sheldrake and his team or whoever <laughs> wants to discount the fact that the dog could pick up on subtle clues from the environment or the people around the dog, um, this means that the dog being psychic is more plausible than the dog <laughs> picking up on cues around them. And for anybody who listened to our animal intelligence episode, we talked a lot about how animals learn a lot about their environment. Some of them really quickly, especially companion animals, can pick up on things really fast for people that they're close to. So why is it more likely that a dog is psychic than that they learn routines fast? Because we well, really want him to be psychic. It, yeah. it doesn't have to be more likely, Laura. Stop thinking like a Bayesian. It just has to be a p-value of 0.05. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I'm a fan of the bathroom hypothesis. The yeah. bathroom hypothesis? The bathroom hypothesis. Was it? The hypothesis that the dog was used to going out when, when the owner came home. And the dog had to pee at the same time every day. Because your, your bladder gets used to it. Right. So I think the dog just had to go pee. <laughs> <laughs> we can never discount that with dogs, right? Mm -hmm. So that is JT the psychic, probably not psychic dog. 
So let's talk about Daryl Bem. Bem uh, is a professor emeritus of psychology who retired from Cornell in 2007. While he has dabbled in parapsychology, much of his career has actually been spent pursuing what we might consider more promising avenues of research, if we wanted to be charitable. <laughs> I like the question mark in there. <laughs> Less total nonsense avenues of research, uh, including investigations into group decision-making processes, personality theory, and the etiology of sexual orientation. Bem is known for several prominent and sometimes controversial theories, including uh, self-perception theory, which uh, is kind of uh, in contrast with cognitive dissonance theory. Self-perception theory proposes that we infer our own beliefs by observing our own actions, in the same way we infer the beliefs of others by observing their actions. Wow. Uh, for example, we might watch Chris Christie endorse Donald Trump, and infer that he supports Trump's ideals, you know, like... Unless you actually watched him, because he looked extremely <laughs> uncomfortable doing this hostage. <laughs> well, that, that's where self-perception theory comes in. Uh, because according to self-perception theory, whatever Chris Christie's initial reasons for endorsing Trump, the act of endorsing him will cause Christie to see himself as a Trump supporter, and Christie's views will come to more closely align with Trump's over time. Time. You know, he'll start wanting to build walls and, you know, be a fascist and, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> Deport people. Another idea advanced by Bem is the exotic becomes erotic theory of sexual orientation, which is controversial. Is good? Uh, <laughs> it proposes that biological factors uh, are mediated, at least to some degree, by childhood experiences and temperament, which is, you know, possible. I guess. Um, in brief, he argues that children who engage in activities that are gender conforming will identify with other children of their own gender, while those who enjoy non-gender conforming activities, you know, like playing with dolls if you're a boy or playing with trucks if you're a girl or whatever, uh, will identify more with children of the opposite gender. Thus, children interested in activities that are gender atypical will come to see other children of their own gender as an exotic outgroup, as an other, which eventually results in sexual attraction. So you're normally attracted to members of the outgroup, but if you're already engaging in activities with what would normally be the outgroup, now the outgroup is the in-group and your group is the outgroup, yeah, it's, I know. <laughs> You guys can't, <laughs> listeners can't see it, but I've got this face. That I, I, it feels like I'm sucking on a lemon listening to this, quite honestly. Uh, Bem is also one of few mainstream psychologists who contend that the Gansfeld experiments demonstrate evidence of psi phenomena, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, but he's probably most well-known to skeptics for his Feeling the Future study, which was published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology in 2011. This paper claimed to find small but statistically significant evidence for retroactive causation. Oh no. That is to say uh, that some psychological effects preceded their causes. Effectively, that people could feel the future just a little bit, but that they themselves were unaware of that ability. Uh, so I'll quote from the abstract for the study, because it provides a fairly good overview of, uh, of his claims. Precognition and premonition are themselves special cases of a more general phenomenon, the anomalous retroactive influence of some future event on an individual's current responses, whether those responses are conscious or non-conscious, cognitive or affective, uh, meaning emotional. This article reports nine experiments involving more than 1,000 participants that test for retroactive influence by time-reversing well-established psychological effects so that the individual's responses are obtained before the putatively causal stimulus events occur. Data are presented for four time-reversed effects, precognitive approach to erotic stimuli and precognitive avoidance of negative stimuli, retroactive priming, retroactive habituation, and retroactive facilitation of recall. All but one of the experiments yielded statistically significant results. So basically what Ben did was take several well-established psychological tests, and we're talking tests so well-established as to be boring, <laughs> and he ran them backwards. Uh, for example, it is non-controversial that rehearsing a set of words will make them easier to remember. 
So one of Bem's nine experiments attempted to test the hypothesis that rehearsing a set of words in the future can make them easier to remember right now. So what Bem did yeah, <laughs> is he showed participants a set of words and tested how well they could recall them. And then Bem presented the subjects with a randomized subset of those words to rehearse, hypothesizing that the words that they had done better at recalling in the past would be the words that they were later randomly assigned to practice. I think that's actually a really cool experiment, but the idea that it would work is preposterous. Well, it did! Oh no. Uh, <laughs> at least, according to Bem, to, you know, statistical, if not actual, significance. <laughs> In another trial, uh, the one that got the most play on the Colbert Report, naturally, Bem had participants sit in front of a computer screen that displayed two curtains and asked them to predict which curtain had a picture behind it. After the participants selected a curtain, the computer randomly selected a picture and placed it behind either the left or the right curtain, and then the curtains were opened. The thing that makes this so weird is that the hypothesis being tested here was that if the computer randomly selected a, quote, highly arousing erotic picture, which seems to be psychology speak for really great porn, uh, <laughs> then the subject would do a better job at guessing which curtain it would appear behind <laughs> in the future. And according to Pem's rather unorthodox statistical analysis, he was right. One of the primary criticisms of Bem's research beyond, this is ridiculous, why should anyone take this seriously, <laughs> is the apparent abuse of what uh, is sometimes called researcher degrees of freedom. Uh, things like how many subjects to use for an experiment, when to stop collecting data, and what type of statistical analysis should be used on the results. All of these things need to be decided beforehand when you're doing an experiment, but unfortunately this isn't always the case. Say you're doing a study on coin flips, and you plan to do 100 flips and analyze the results. If after 50 flips, you peek at the results and find that you have 22 heads and 28 tails, you might decide to end the experiment early and declare that you have a coin that is, statistically, magic! <laughs> when, you know, if you did the full 100 flips, that might have regressed to the mean. So the methodology of the people are really good at predicting really great porn experiment was apparently changed completely halfway through, which renders the results meaningless. Wow. Some commentators have guessed that uh, this experiment might have originally been two experiments, but when they came up negative, they may have had their data sets combined, allowing for a statistically significant result. But because we don't have the original data, just the summaries that Bem provided, uh, you know, we can't say that for sure. Other criticisms have focused on several potential problems with BEM's statistical analysis. Many advocates for a Bayesian approach, of course, found the use of simple frequentist p-values to be unimpressive, you know, because they don't take into account the prior plausibility of, you know, people being porn psychics. Well, and the degrees of freedom thing is the same problem that we were talking about with the Global Consciousness Project. That right. If you're deciding after the fact where to take your data from that just screws the whole thing up. Oh, yeah. And with these studies, there's always the concern of publication bias, which undermines our ability to judge the experiments in their proper context. So if Bem's experiments had been resoundingly negative, do you think they would have been published? Almost certainly not. As an advocate for Psy, Bem has a vested interest in bolstering the case for these phenomena, and negative results undermine it instead. So he probably would have decided not to publish. But even if Bem is the very paragon of a good scientist and he attempts publication, who will be interested in publishing yet another failed psi experiment? Certainly not a journal as prestigious as Personality and Social Psychology. So for every set of positive results in parapsychology, and even more rigorous scientific fields unfortunately, we have an unknown number of negative results. This publication bias is one of the reasons that replication is so important in science. There were actually many attempts to replicate Bem's experiments after the fact, both by skeptics and by advocates for Psy. So there's always Richard Wiseman's team is always trying to replicate these. Uh, so a replication of one of the experiments by Stuart Ritchie, Chris French, and our prominent skeptic friend Richard Wiseman was carried out in 2012, and it found no evidence for precognition. But the authors had a difficult time getting it published. 
It was eventually published in PLOS One, but not before it had been rejected by the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, Science Brevia, and Psychological Science, all of which apparently refuse to publish replications even when they contradict the findings of a major study. When the paper was submitted to the British Journal of Psychology, one of the two peer reviewers objected to its publication, and the editors ended up rejecting the paper. Would anyone care to guess who that reviewer turned out to be? Bem? Daryl Bem! <laughs> <laughs> you can't be a reviewer on your own, like... Oh. Yeah, somebody screwed up there. <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite explanations for why Wiseman's replication was negative? Mm-hmm. According to some parapsychological advocates, he didn't account for the possibility that he himself was psychic, but since he didn't believe in Psy, he was psychically influencing the experiment to be negative. Wow. That is some special <laughs> bleeding. That, that takes a little time to wrap your brain around yeah. that. So in 2012, the same journal that published Ben's original experiments published a follow-up article by Gaelic et al. titled, Correcting the Past, Failures to Replicate Psy. The paper reported on seven experiments testing for precognition that, quote, found no evidence supporting its existence. While some psychologists point out that BEM's research does meet the evidentiary standards of the field, hence its original publication in a pretty high-impact journal, others have used this to argue that the publication of Feeling the Future is itself evidence that the standards of experimental psychology are insufficient. Yep. In a 2011 article published in Review of General Psychology, Etienne Lebel and Kurt Peters use BEM's research as a case study, suggesting that experimental psychology is systematically biased toward interpretations of data that favor the theories of the experimenter. A problem, unfortunately, that is not limited to psychology. No. Yeah, we talked about this a couple podcasts ago, didn't we, where we were discussing how because these kinds of studies can be published is one of the reasons why the publication standards should be overhauled. But I don't think it was a psychology study we were talking about. Anyway. <laughs> no, but I mean, these problems show up in every part. <laughs> yeah. Uh, publication bias uh, gets the most play in the medical field because it's used by big pharma. And uh, that's one of the reasons that, uh, you know, I, I'm uh, an enthusiastic advocate for trial registries and mm -hmm. for the All Trials Project. So there are some journals that are dedicated entirely to replications now, yeah. too, which is great. It's a new journal in plant sciences that only, oh, okay. posts negative results. So new, new Negatives in Plant Science is a new pilot journal uh, that uh, apparently only spotlights negative and controversial data. Fantastic. Interesting. Yeah. I think there's been a few of those popping up recently because of this issue that nobody will publish a negative study. Yeah. So yeah. Elsevier is doing a whole set of the new negatives. Cool. Because that, that pilot was from 2015. One of the few times you can congratulate Elsevier on anything. <laughs> it is what it is. Yep. <laughs> so, now it's time to have some fun. Game time, yay! Woo it's time to play Psychic Fact or Psychic Fiction. This game consists of a series of eight rounds. Each round, I'm going to name and describe a method of divination or fortune telling, and then the panelists will each have to select fact or fiction. Fact means that the method I named is actually used by occult practitioners as described, and fiction means that either it differs from the description I gave, or I made it up out of whole cloth. For each round, we will rotate who answers first, and I've randomly selected a starting order. Laura will answer first, followed by Lauren, then Ashlyn for the first round. Is everybody ready? I'm ready. Mm -hmm. Okay. Round one. Psychic fact or psychic fiction? Chiromancy is the practice of studying the spine and or ribs of a subject to divine their future. Laura, psychic fact or psychic fiction? Oh man, I just want to say, like, oh. <laughs> it's hard because everything is going to sound ridiculous and everything's going to be like, well, if it sounds that ridiculous, somebody probably is trying to peddle it as a psychic something or other. Um, fact. Psychic fact. Ashlyn? Hmm. I feel like 
I don't think Cairo is the root of the words that, like, spine and ribs come from. No, it's osteo I think for it's, bone. Well, yeah, but I don't know. There might be another word for, for the spine. I don't know. So I'm going to go with fiction because I think it'd be called something else. Okay, that's two facts and a fiction. That is a fiction. Woo! And Ashlyn was on to it. Anyone know what chiromancy really is? Well, Cairo is hand, right? Cairo is hand, not spine. Uh, so chiromancy is another word for palmistry. Really? Yeah. Mm. Oh. Interesting. A much cooler word for palmistry. <laughs> okay, so uh, Ashlyn gets the point there. Doesn't Lauren also get the point? No. No, I she don't. said fact. I said fact. She, she went with oh, Laura. I thought there was two fictions. Sometimes. Nope. You were alone. Okay, so round two. Spatulamancy, or spatulamancy, I'm really not sure, <laughs> is a form of divination that involves examining the shoulder blades of an animal, usually shortly after slaughter. And we're going to start with Lauren this time. Spatulamancy, fact or fiction? I want to say scapulamancy instead. Yeah. Yeah, because that's, like, the shoulder. That's yeah. actually part of the shoulder. But then I also want to go with UHF Spatula City. <laughs> fiction. Okay, Lauren goes with fiction. Ashlyn? Spatulamancy. To resume. Why, why wouldn't it be scapulamancy? Somebody misread it and decided to base an entire field of quackery on it? I'm going to go fact because it's so ridiculous. Okay. And Laura? Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> it's so ridiculous, but it like either way... You know, because you added, like, the words, you know, or maybe I just, you know, changed something about it. That's what makes it so hard, Newman. Uh... So we've got fact, fiction, or F off Newman. <laughs> That's generally my answer. Um, I, I got to do fiction. That one just sounds so stupid. And I, I feel it would be way more believable to actually have some kind of divination where you just drop spatulas and read them. <laughs> and that would be spatulamancy. And it'd be like, yeah, I would totally believe somebody is doing that. Sure. I foresee that somebody is doing the dishes shortly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that one is fact. Oh, good job, All Ashlyn. Right. <laughs> yeah, Ashlyn's on a roll. However, I had to bite my tongue because spatulamancy is also called scapulamancy. So <laughs> spatula uh, comes from the uh, comes from the Latin. It's uh, it means uh, flat or beaten. So I, I believe that that's where the, uh, the yeah. Word well, I think they both have the from. same root word, but yeah, that still doesn't make any sense. I was trying I was trying to validate that as as you were talking. <laughs> but so spatulamancy, which is also called scapulamancy, is classified as one of the seven forbidden arts in a fourteen fifty six text by Johannes Hartlieb, along with. Necromancy, geomancy, aromancy, pyromancy, hydromancy, and chiromancy. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so Ashlyn is leading the pack 2-0, and we're on to round three. So Ashlyn is going to have to answer first. Psychic fact or psychic fiction, theriomancy, also known as zoomancy, is a class of divination that involves observing the behavior of animals. That sounds legit. Psychic fact. I don't know the root words in this case, so I can't spout off. Laura? Yeah, that seems reasonable. <laughs> Our standards <laughs> have fallen. <laughs> in context. Yes. I'm also going to go with fact, but it sounds more like horses with fario. So and ho therio. Oh, therio. Okay. The teach, well, the heck with or me. Or thorn, if you will. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, let's, let's make it a trifecta of fact. Okay, that is a fact. Uh, one of the most popular forms of theriomancy for many centuries is electriomancy, or divination by observing the behavior of cockerels. <laughs> and the reason I didn't uh, I didn't use that one in particular is because I was laughing about it with Laura just the other day. Uh, another popular that is extremely specific. <laughs> yep. Yeah, another popular form of theriomancy among groups uh, uh, in Nigeria and West Cameroon is called magam and involves interpreting the actions of spiders or crabs. Hmm. So they use little things. They don't use like puppies or herds of zebra. <laughs> I, I guess. I guess not. <laughs> well, because I mean, like, there are people who will say that dogs and cats, for example, can tell when there's going to be an earthquake. So that's what I thought it was going to get at. But yeah. so electromancy, for example, they would like scatter corn or whatever and mm -hmm. just watch the way that the cockerels moved. The the roosters, cool. you know, moved. Uh, okay, round four. Laura's going to go first. 
Uh, psychic fact or psychic fiction? Cephalomancy was a popular form of theriomancy in the 17th century in which a person's fortune would be told by placing an octopus on their head or shoulders and observing the direction of its movement. Cephalomancy. Sorry, what century was this? 17th. Anything's possible. That's the thing. Like, <laughs> all of these things could quite easily be fact. Like, when you make them up, they're not significantly more astounding than the... Fa- oh, God. Uh... Everybody's favorite guessing game. Oh, I hate this game. <laughs> uh... oh. oh, I picked that up. Fiction. Why not? Lauren? I know your propensity for using octopi. Or octopodies. Excuse me. <laughs> I was not going to correct you, but... Yeah. I'm gonna go with fact. Can okay. I have the question read again? Cephalomancy... Cephalopods. ...was a popular form of theriomancy in the 17th century in which a person's fortune would be told by placing an octopus on their head or shoulders and observing the direction of its movement. Hmm. Because, like, yeah, hmm. Huh. That the cephalo could be like octopus or it could be head, but they're both involved here. Or it could just be gem. (laughs) That's true. And there's been there's been like a couple facts in a row, so I'm gonna go fiction just based on that. In my defense I do randomize the 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 fact and fiction ordering here, but that is indeed a fiction. Woohoo! I made up the part about the octopus. Yeah. Congratulations. Um, I'm falling behind for the crap test. <laughs> but uh, cephalomancy is real, uh, you know, as far as these things go. <laughs> According to some sources, it is a means of scrying by examining skulls, also known as craniognomy. Uh, Oof. Yeah, that's unpleasant to say. Uh, word. Other sources indicate that cephalomancy or cephalonomancy involved heating the skull of a donkey or goat while names or phrases were recited. And if the jaw moved or the skull cracked when a name was spoken, this was taken as a sign that the word was significant, and uh, apparently this was used to identify the guilty party in, like, criminal trials and stuff. That's <laughs> awful. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, round five. We're halfway done. Aww. Practitioners of gyromancy would inscribe a wheel on the ground with letters around its edge and then spin in circles until they stumbled across, noting which letters they touched. Uh, we're going to start with Lauren. Sure, we'll call that a fact what? because spirographs are great. Okay. So they, they spun the wheel. No, no, no. They, they spun they would, themselves. They would draw a wheel on the ground okay. and then just spin in circles. And, they would and when like they toddlers. stumbled out of the wheel, they would figure out which which letters they touched. When I they love it. That. Absolutely fact. Okay. And <laughs> it's a toddler Ouija board. And Laura. Uh, fiction. We are so doing this in the backyard for your daughter to do. <laughs> so this, this is, is really fast. gyromancy is psychic fact. Yes. Oh, I'm at like 100%, aren't I? <laughs> according, to, according to Occult Sciences by Arthur Waite, this practice of spinning, stumbling, and noting a letter would be repeated until the practitioner, quote, evolved an intelligible sentence or till death or madness intervened. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how often that happens. <laughs> Once. Round six. Entomancy is the practice of reading omens by studying the branching patterns of uh, tree limbs or leaves. Ashlyn, psychic mm-hmm. fact or psychic Entomancy. fiction? Entomancy. Sorry, what was the word? Entomancy is the practice of reading omens by studying the patterns of branches and leaves in a tree. I think entomancy sounds more like some sort of bug divination. I'm going to go fiction. Okay. Laura? I'm going to go fact. And Lauren? Fiction because Tolkien. Yep. (laughs) That was a reference to Tolkien. I tried to sneak in there. (laughs) See, I was thinking that, but then I'm like, I don't know what the roots for trees are in every language. Sure, let's go with that. So, uh... (laughs) Entomancy is a real thing, and as Ashlyn noted, uh, it does have to do with bugs. It's yes. a type of theriomancy, which involves observing the behavior of insects. And, of course, it shares a root with entomology. Science degree comes in handy again. Yeah. Obviously, if, uh, if it had been really about studying the patterns of, uh, of leaves in, in trees... Like arboromancy or um, something? No, it would be hornomancy. Come on. Sorry, n- another Tolkien reference. The yeah. Wh- uh, never mind. Um, <laughs> I got it, and I left it where it was. <laughs> okay, round seven. We're almost done, Laura. <laughs> Stay with me. 
the Chinese practice of, excuse me, Yanchen Yuyan requires fortune tellers to blow hot ash and sometimes even embers across a person's body. Ouch. So, Laura, psychic fact or psychic fiction? Yanchen Yuyan. Fact. Laura. Fact. Ashlyn. That horrifies me. I hope it's fiction. I'm going to say fiction. And Ashlyn continues her incredible winning streak. <laughs> I made this one up out of whole cloth. Uh, with apologies to our Chinese listeners, I just typed soot prophecy into Google Translate. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And uh, finally, round eight, Claydonism is a form of divination that involves eavesdropping on strangers and interpreting the words one hears. We'll start with Lauren. Psychic fact or psychic fiction? How's that spelled? It is C L E D O N I S M. Oh, fact. Okay. That sounds more like hot reading. <laughs> Uh, so, so to be clear, the uh, you're not eavesdropping on strangers to uh, to tell their future. Okay. You're eavesdropping on strangers. Their words are Prophecies unrelated, for but inter- you. yeah, yeah. Oh, and and you interpret that for like your client or for yourself. I will say no more. Yeah. But but the words are interpreted. It's not just like hearing what somebody is saying and yeah. then repeating that to them. It's not Peter Popoff. <laughs> uh, yeah, fact. Okay, and Laura. Fact. And you are all correct. Uh, it is psychic fact. Apparently this was popular in ancient Greece. Hmm. An individual would whisper a question in the temple of a god and then plug their ears and make for the exit. And they'd unstop their ears once they got into the crowd and listen for their answer among the chance words overheard from pedestrians. That sounds can... kind of fun. It does sound kind of and fun. And that, that one makes... Of the things that you've discussed, <laughs> that one... Like, not that it would actually work, but I can see that one be a more realistic kind of tool in a lot of ways. It's one way that the gods could act if there were gods. Yeah. It's also a really fun way to spend the afternoon, just going to the mall and listening to other people's conversations. (laughs) Ashlyn and I do this constantly. (laughs) So, uh, Ashlyn is the winner with an uncanny perfect score, almost as if she's psychic. again. (laughs) This is the last game I can play because I'll never beat this score. <laughs> exactly. You will go out uh, with an untarnished record. You're good to go. <laughs> Wait, but that means I'm probably going to have to make up the games now, so. No, oh, be my guest. <laughs> no. Or we could just stop having games. Yes, I love games. Oh. I know you hate them. But... I don't hate them. They just always come after we've been talking for a long time. Yeah, well, I also think they make the, the show really fun. They do. Maybe we should do games first. Or yeah. all games. All games go. all the time. All games all the time. Somebody else can do that, because it is a lot of work to put together one of those things. Before we go, uh, I just figured we should mention that the Winnipeg Skeptics now has a newsletter. I think we've mentioned it at least once on the show before. We're retiring our meetup page after, what, six years now? Been yeah, gone, five I and think? a half anyway. Uh, because meetup is incredibly expensive, and a newsletter is incredibly not. Yeah. So go to lueepodcast.wordpress.com and there will be a link in the sidebar to subscribe to our monthly email newsletter, which includes recent and upcoming topics from LUEE and a bunch of news items of interest and uh, upcoming events for Winnipeg Skeptics. But it's not just for locals, so uh, feel free to check it out. Yeah, you'll get the podcast emailed to you every month. It's super convenient. Uh, next month on the show, we're going to be solving homelessness. Wow. Uh, we thought that'd be a Easy topic to yeah, tackle in an that's, hour. That's we'll a... knock, knock that one out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have time for a snack afterwards. And, we'll be uh, good to go. Hopefully we'll have our friend Brendan on that we have, you know, talked about a few times, and he's always a hoot. Awesome. <laughs> I look forward to it. Well, until then, uh, thanks for joining me tonight, folks. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. You've been listening to Life, the Universe, and Everything Else. If you have any questions or comments, or you'd like to suggest a topic for the show, send us an email at l-u-e-e-podcast at winnipegskeptics.com. If you want to show your support, give us a review on iTunes or Stitcher, follow us on Twitter or Facebook, or just share the show with a friend. Our music is produced by the very talented Ian James, and this episode was edited by Jem Newman. Everybody shut up for a second. I love you all, but shut up. Date nights recently have been, can we get rid of Kira for a little while and do nothing? Oh, hallelujah. Yes.
Can we silently watch this show together and bask in the silence? Oh. <laughs> yeah. That's like us. I think we last shaved our legs in about 2013. <laughs> For the record, we are currently recording. <laughs> Well, that can go right into the outtakes. Yeah. <laughs> so as we're both preparing, I was going, it's so long, it's so long. I've written like three extra paragraphs and I meant to write one. And I said, Jem, write it like you would be explaining it to Kira. Like, not that simple, but like, break it right down. Okay, even and though this like, doesn't speak to, to, to my character, I need to point out that I didn't say I wrote three, three paragraphs when I meant to write one. I said I wrote three segments when I meant to write one. <laughs> So, Jim, why don't you just write all the segments and hand them out when we get here? Yeah. No, 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 because then we actually will be recording, like, two-hour podcasts. <laughs> Everybody we'll... else's segments will be as long as mine, then. And we'll all sound like Jim. <laughs> that would be a problem. That would be a problem. It's bad enough that one of us sounds like Jim. You're listening to Life, the Universe, and Everything Else. Today on the show, we're talking about parapsychology. That's gross. <laughs> it was so much <laughs> It was, it was not spit. Oh, it was beard oh, runoff. Was, oh, that's even worse. Oh. I have coffee in my mustache. Oh, oh my god. Oh, yeah, my body's covered in coffee. Oh, I look your at it. He did. Facial hair, please. Okay. <laughs> All right. So many outtakes. Are we good? Oh. We're good. You just don't spit on your phone again. It wasn't spit. Whatever. It was coffee that blew out of my mustache as I was speaking. <laughs> yeah. Do not project your coffee droplets onto your phone again, okay? <laughs> oh, boy. That was definitely a plosive pee. <laughs> Can I get you a napkin? I need a napkin. <laughs> oh, my God. And I did a couple of experiments with psychic Actually, staring. Actually, what's not psychic staring? That's staring. Ah! Stop it. <laughs> the hypothesis being tested here was that if the computer randomly selected a, quote, highly arousing erotic picture, which seems to be psychology speak for really great porn, uh, <laughs> then the subject would do a better job at guessing which curtain it would appear behind. He just wanted people to look at porn. That's not unique to Bam. I think that's just what a lot of psychologists like, like to do to people. <laughs> Uh, one of the primary... It's for crit- science! It's for science, <laughs> I swear! I'm just imagining somebody walking into his lab and then, like, shutting his laptop. I was, uh, preparing, uh, some research! One of the... <laughs> because we don't have the original data, just the summaries that Ben provided, uh, you know, we can't say that for sure. Did he only pay for a month on Pornhub? And- <laughs> <laughs> Laura looks like she just wants to die. 